So first of all, of course, I would like to uh, thank Wider for uh, inviting me uh, to make this presentation. But I also want to take just two minutes to express my very great gratitude to uh, Finn Tarp. Uh, um, I feel that what he has achieved uh, in his long term at Wider is simply uh, incredible. And of course, I would echo the words of uh, Jose Antonio. Uh, Wider has become uh, the uh, uh, nucleus, uh, the, the world center of development uh, economics. And uh, to uh, a large extent, it is to due, due to uh, the uh, leadership of a number of directors. But certainly, uh, Finn, I think, has played a wonderful role in uh, getting wider where it is. And what I admire so much in uh, Finn is that he's not only uh, an extremely good administrator, he's a field man. Uh, it seems to me that most of the messages that I sent him over the last uh, five, 10 years uh, were answered from Hanoi, Mozambique, uh, New York, uh, uh, on the way to uh, wherever. So. Finn, in a way, represents a combination of qualities which are extremely important in development, which is field experience, uh, good knowledge of uh, economic uh, theory, interest in applications, in data, and good administrative skills. So thank you very much, Finn, for your uh, leadership. So um, the, let me mention very uh, uh, quickly the content of my talk. Um, I'll start with a preamble and uh, a very brief review of some of my important contacts with uh, uh, people who were essentially giants in the field of uh, economic development. And then I want to elaborate uh, a number of themes. I'll start with African development. Second theme, uh, income distribution, inequality, and poverty. And the third theme is uh, economic structure, interdependence, and uh, quantitative development economics. Um, as I will mention in just a few minutes, um, I'm planning to write what is a semi-autobiographical booklet uh, which will describe my journey through the history of development economics. So the first three themes I will be presenting here, but later on, hopefully, I will be able to complete the other themes, which are pattern of world trade, globalization, role of agriculture and economic development and structural transformation, employment and basic needs, and the role of institutions in economic development. So what was my motivation in uh, writing my journey? I had recently completed a uh, uh, chapter in uh, what is going to be a new handbook of development economics which is uh, co-edited by uh, our chairman, together with uh, Machiko Nisanke, on the history of the evolution of the development economics doctrine from 1950 to 2017. And it occurred to me that for a number of reasons, which you can see on the screen, my professional career overlapped pretty much with the period during which development economics existed. Uh, development economics as a discipline really started, I would say, at the end of the Second World War. Second reason was that I was fortunate enough to have met and often collaborated with some of the giants in the field. And I thought perhaps that by reviewing some of my uh, modest contributions, um, I could 
by including some of the anecdote, including some of uh, the personal interactions with these giants in the field, uh, enlivened the narrative around the history of development uh, economics. Now, um, hopefully, some uh, younger researchers can learn something from uh, my story, and uh, uh, not all of the uh, story is uh, positive, as, as you will see. And of course, a disclaimer is in order at the outset. Um, great humility is called for when you're going to go over your own uh, journey. And uh, I certainly beg your indulgence if you feel that uh, um, there has been, on my part, a failure of uh, uh, being humble and a lack of uh, modesty. Uh, my intention was certainly not to uh, uh, promote my modest contributions. I'm better aware than anybody else of the limitations of my own contributions. But I basically thought that uh, this was a nice way of, of looking at development economics. Um, one uh, aspect of my uh, contributions is that because of personal impatience, I never stayed with one field for a very long period of time. I would essentially go from one field within, econo with, within economic development to another field and very often work on these different themes uh, simultaneously. So let me first go through very quickly some of the uh, influential experiences. Um, I attended the uh, Netherlands School of Economics, 1947 to 51. I was a student of Tinbergen, but of course at that time I didn't know him. In those days when the professor came into the room, every student had to stand up and the distance between professors and students was enormous. Um, later, I'm going to say a few words about Tinbergen as an individual. Uh, he was the first Nobel laureate in economics, which is quite an achievement, because at that time, the whole pool of economists was available to choose from, and the fact that he was the first one, I think, uh, uh, is uh, significant. Um, I attended the University of California from 52 to 57. Um, I worked uh, with Professor Condleff, who had been um, a professor at uh, LSE, um, had just written a book on the uh, um, commerce of nations, which was at that time becoming a classic. Uh, he, was, he represented really a, a view of economics that was the more literary view. And I was also attracted to the more quantitative side. And so I enjoyed Dorfman, uh, Liebenstein. Erm Edelman was a classmate of mine. And as you will see later on, I worked uh, fairly closely with uh, uh, Irma on a number of projects. Um, very early on in my career, I presented a paper. This was in, at SMU. And uh, Gottfried Haberlum was in the audience. Um, and he was extremely complimentary. He invited me uh, to present a paper at the uh, 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 AEA meeting. And so my first published paper appeared in the uh, AER, which uh, was unusual at that time. Uh, my first job was at Iowa State University, and I was greatly influenced by Carl Fox and uh, Gerhard Tintner, who was one of the founders of uh, Econometrica. Then I had a uh, staying at the National Planning Institute in Lima that I will describe. Um, in the 60s, I, I worked very closely with uh, Hollis Chenry and uh, Gus Reynes at USAID. I had something to do with the uh, creation of the uh, development research center at the uh, World Bank. Uh, 
Then later on, I spent a few years at the uh, ILO in Geneva uh, with the uh, World Employment Program, met Graham Pyatt, started working on a new methodology, which is the uh, social accounting matrix, trying to include basic needs and poverty into the uh, SAM framework. Um, I worked later with uh, Paul Streeton, um, something to do with uh, world development. Again, I'll mention something of it. When I joined Pro, uh, uh, Cornell, um, I uh, chaired for many years the program on comparative economic development and collaborated with uh, many of my colleagues. Uh, most of them are here today, uh, Koshik, uh, uh, Ravi, uh, uh, Gary, uh, and a number of others. Um, later on, I was invited to write a white paper by uh, Harris Moulet, who was the uh, permanent secretary of the Treasury in Kenya, on uh, basic needs and poverty in Kenya. And that essentially started my work uh, in uh, uh, Africa. Um, subsequently, essentially for a long period of time, I had contact with the OECD Development Center, Ian Little, uh, Christian Morrison, and so on. And then the last uh, 25 years, I've uh, worked very closely with the uh, African Economic uh, uh, Research Consortium. More recently, uh, Finn had invited me to be active in the uh, Nordic Development Association. And I had one big project, collaborative project, with WIDER on the impact of globalization on the uh, world poor. So let me start with the, uh, the first uh, theme. And as many of the presenters at uh, this meeting have indicated, um, there has been a quantum jump um, in GDP in Africa, essentially from zero per capita uh, GDP growth rate to something like two and a half, three percent after 2000. And there is some, uh, there's some evidence that this growth has been more inclusive, not sufficiently inclusive, but more inclusive than it had been in the past. So one of the things that I try to do in the uh, uh, paper was to look at some of the contributions that were made by uh, uh, distinguished research researchers based on the African setting, the African initial conditions. And again, you can look at it very clear, clear, quickly. Uh, the harris todaro model, uh, Joe's efficiency wage theory, the informal sector, Bates, urban bias, the enclave economies, uh, and so on, including uh, the FGT measure that was conceived in uh, Kenya, but really born at uh, Cornell. So um, let me tell you how I really became um, involved in, in a deep sense in African development. In 1994, there was a conference in Paris at the OECD Development Center entitled, What Future for Africa? And they had asked me to write a paper with a, uh, an African colleague, a student of mine. And essentially, we argued that there were two very different approaches to development. One was the World Bank, IMF, uh, um, very hard-nosed, uh, conditionality-based approach, and the kind of adjustment with the human face strategy uh, promoted by UNICEF. Paul Collier was a discussant, and 
was extremely critical of uh, uh, my uh, ambivalence, uh, essentially saying there's only one approach, which is the IMF World Bank approach. Uh, growth is everything. Um, and as I mentioned to him at that time, uh, it came as a real cold shower. I wasn't ready for it. And it reminded the time that I was a boarder at the International School in Geneva. And at 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, all of the boarders had to take a cold shower. And for five minutes, this was uh, quite uh, uh, painful. <laughs> now, I, I, I must admit that uh, prior to that conference, my involvement with Africa had been limited. but. Uh, it was not non-existent. I had done some work in the, uh, what was Zaire at that time on uh, corruption. I had done some work on, uh, on Kenya. Um, but clearly, I wasn't a, uh, an African expert. And it was very surprising that uh, Beno Nadulo, who at that time was the executive director of the AERC, approached me and invited me to evaluate the research program of the uh, AERC. And in all modesty, um, I perhaps can claim that I have now become a uh, bona fide African development expert. So perhaps I should be thankful to Paul Collier for the uh, uh, cold shower. So very quickly, what are some of my modest contributions to uh, uh, African development? Um, <clears throat> one of my major recommendations in the evaluation of the research and training program of the AERC at that time was that it was inexcusable not to have a poverty theme um, in the continent with where poverty was endemic. So I, I, I think one of the things that I did achieve was to promote the need for poverty analysis. I also helped organize a number of training workshops with uh, leading scholars. Martin uh, Revelian was one of the uh, trainers at uh, one of these workshops. Uh, but we had really the leading uh, poverty analysts uh, available to train the Africans. And I would estimate that we probably trained something like 150 <clears throat> African economists in this uh, methodology. Uh, subsequently, um, again, through the AERC, we uh, uh, initiated a number of collaborative uh, projects um, one of which I think was very successful, and it involved a number of universities, which you can see uh, uh, Cornell was the lead institution, but Copenhagen, Gothenburg, Laval, Oxford, CRD. And uh, it led to um, a, a modality which many of the younger African scholars, and some of them in the meantime have become quite uh, distinguished, um, have called twinning. And twinning meant that uh, networks of, uh, um, or teams of uh, Africans from a country would come and spend as long as maybe three months with an institution uh, in order to uh, uh, learn about poverty analysis, uh, learn about uh, software packages, uh, uh, the handling of uh, large-scale uh, surveys. Um, and some of the, uh, the leading young, uh, and maybe not so young, uh, development e economists, such as uh, uh, Murray Leibrandt, uh, Harun Borat, uh, Germano Mwabu, did come to Cornell or to other institutions uh, and feel that uh, this type of uh, twinning was uh, very useful. OK, so now in terms of research, very quickly, um, I uh, worked on the anatomy of growth in Africa. 
trying to understand better the Bourguignon Triangle, the interrelationships among growth, inequality, and uh, uh, poverty. Um, I try to analyze the uh, changing structure of growth. And uh, if I may disagree in a very gently way with the uh, earnest uh, presentation yesterday, I feel that uh, um, his diagnosis was perhaps a little bit too pessimistic. Um, in 12 of the 14 countries that I examined, I do find evidence of structural transformation that was successful in the sense that the workers moving out of agriculture would find jobs outside of agriculture where the wages were higher, where they were more productive. Now, granted, this wasn't in industry. It was essentially in services. But it shows some structural change in the, uh, in the right uh, direction. Did some work on uh, uh, poverty con convergence. Uh, um, I have a paper coming out uh, where I extend the, uh, the data set uh, used by uh, Martin Revelian by something like uh, six to eight years. Um, and we essentially uh, confirm his results. But what we find, and granted it's a limited sample, but what we find is that in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, largely, I think, because of uh, the role of private aid, the Gates Foundation, the allocation of aid was such that it benefited the poorer countries as well as the uh, poorer segments within countries more than the non-poor. And in this way, we do find evidence of some uh, poverty convergence within uh, Africa. So anyway, I was recently, uh, um, the African Development Institute at Cornell and the, the AERC organized a symposium in my uh, modest honor. And uh, I uh, was very pleased. And of course, uh, um, I hope you forgive me for putting this on the screen. But if you read it, uh, it does mention that uh, my work on uh, Africa did make uh, some difference. And my reward was to see the improvement in the quality of the research of uh, the younger Africans. I, um, over a 25-year period, uh, I've been very impressed by uh, this improvement. OK, let me move very quickly to the second topic, um, income distribution, um, inequality, and uh, poverty. And I'm starting with uh, two quotes, one by uh, an atheist and one essentially uh, a Christian. Um, Marx held that politics is determined by economics and imagined that what people most desire is to grow rich. Experience since his time has shown that there's something which people desire even more strongly, and that is to keep others poor. There's some truth to it. And then, of course, the Christian view is the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. So uh, I must say that it was my Peruvian uh, experience in the uh, 60s under an Alliance for Progress project that uh, made me a development economist. I was working on. Uh, agrarian reforms and uh, um, income distribution between the major regions of uh, uh, Peru. And the, uh, as you can see, the Gini coefficient of land distribution was something like 0.88. Uh, uh, and I, I, I was really facing a moral conflict, because on the one hand, the project that uh, um, had been instituted by USAID called for the training of Peruvian students in economics. And many of the, my students came from 
families of oligarchs, so we would be invited to these wonderful parties. Uh, um, I remember meeting Miss Universe at uh, one of the parties. Uh, I remember uh, some of the uh, uh, parents of my students going to Paris uh, to buy designer clothes over the weekend. And the moral conflict I was facing was on the one hand, I enjoyed this kind of life. On the other hand, I felt that uh, it was quite inequitable. And that's when I decided that I would devote my uh, life to uh, development economics. Let me just mention a, a very funny interaction with uh, Robert Mundell, another, another Nobel Prize laureate. He came and visited Peru at that time. And uh, he was an early advocate of uh, monetarism. And at that time, I had been working on a model of Peru uh, where growth was export-led. And he said, you know, I don't believe in, in all this multiplier kind of analysis. Why don't you just use the money supply, increase the money supply, and that's going to contribute to, uh, to growth? And I said, yes, but I... That assumes that the uh, velocity of circulation of money is pretty much constant. And I don't believe that. And he said, well, check it. So I got the data. At that time, you had very few data. And to my great surprise, I found that, indeed, V had remained totally constant over a 10-year period. And it's only later on that I found the reason for this. I talked to an economist at the central bank who said, the way we estimate GNP is by multiplying the money supply by a constant velocity of circulation. So that taught me something about reverse uh, causality. Uh, poverty, um, I think it, it was probably my uh, um, the white paper that I wrote for the Kenyan uh, government that forced me to face the issue of uh, apprehending and measuring uh, poverty. Um, and uh, essentially, this led to uh, uh, the, the beginning of the FGT uh, measure. And if I, I, I've had very few creative moments in my career. But I think I had one creative moment um, after having heard uh, Sen, Sen visited Cornell, and at that time, his, the gold standard among poverty measure was uh, Sen's uh, ordinal poverty measure. Uh, basically, the poorest uh, uh, household, um, or let's say the, 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 the poorest household was given a, a weight of uh, n, the next force, n minus 1, and so on. And I felt this was essentially arbitrary because you have a, an infinite number of possible distributions that uh, meet this, this uh, ordinal uh, uh, ordering. So essentially, I said, well, why not take the distance from the poverty line as the actual mean? And this led to what became P2, the, the poverty uh, squared uh, poverty uh, uh, measure. Now, um, the formalization of the FGT, of course, could never have occurred without the help of uh, James Foster, who in the meantime has become a, uh, a distinguished uh, theorist. But I think it was a, it was a work of love and it, it's an example where uh, team research, the complementarity between uh, different skills, makes it possible to uh, come up uh, with a concept uh, that is uh, new. Um, I was very humbled when the Mexican Constitution was amended, this was in 1999, to uh, use P2 as a decision rule in the allocation of central government funds to the provinces in a number of fields, including education, uh, nutrition, uh, and uh, 
uh, health. So let me move uh, very quickly to my uh, third uh, uh, theme um, on economic structure interdependence. Um, I was influenced by uh, uh, Tinbergen, and I just want to say a few words about Tinbergen. Tinbergen was one of the most courteous individuals I've ever met. And later on, um, after I had emigrated to the US, uh, he was extremely nice to me. Uh, quite a few times, he would invite me to lunch. And it was a very formal lunch, him and his wife and uh, a, uh, um, a maid uh, in uh, black attire, white bonnet. And as a very timid uh, economy, young economist at that time, I really have very, had very little to offer in the, uh, in the conversation, but I was a good uh, listener. And later on, I heard this was a, uh, a signal honor. A uh, few people were invited to, uh, to lunch. Another thing I remember about uh, Tinbergen was whenever uh, he invited me to his office, the first thing I would see on his desk was a timer. And uh, the timer was always set for 20 minutes. And regardless of where you were in a conversation, you might be in the middle of a sentence, when the timer rang, this was a time to go. And he would get up, shake your hand, and say how pleased he was to have met you. One of the, the most organized person I've ever met. And I've always wondered if the uh, time allocated to individuals was a function of the reputation of the individual. I don't know, but I know that I was given 20 uh, uh, <laughs> minutes. Um, in those days, uh, planning was a good word, not a bad word. Um, and, and many people forget, I think, some of the success of planning. Uh, the, the Dutch Social Economic Council uh, consisted of representatives of uh, um, employers, organizations, uh, managers, and the crown, the crown being the government. And they would set the goals in terms of economic growth, maximum inflation, share of GNP going to uh, labor as opposed to uh, capital. And it's really worked beautifully for, I would say, almost a, a 10 year uh, period. So um, perhaps there's a lesson to learn that strategic planning in this day and age still has a, uh, uh, an important uh, place. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so let me very quickly again emphasize a few uh, points. Um, in, uh, in the mid-60s, together with Irma Edelman, I organized a conference on the theory and design of economic development, which, which was attended by leaders in the, uh, in the field. And the book that came out was probably the first textbook in development economics. Um, I, I cannot vouch for it, but uh, uh, I do remember that uh, Many uh, development courses at that time did use it as a, uh, as a textbook. One area that always interested me was to expand the uh, dual economy framework. And one of the things that I did with many of my students was to expand it into dual, dual models. And by this, I mean that I would distinguish not only between rural, which is essentially agriculture, and urban, which is essentially non-agriculture, but also between modern and traditional technologies and forms of organization. And that gives you four sectors rather than two. And I think it uh, very often uh, is a more accurate description of the initial uh, conditions. I was very active uh, um, at the beginning of the uh, ILO uh, World Employment Program. Many people have forgotten that the basic needs doctrine was initiated uh, 
within the World Employment Program and then taken over uh, by the, uh, the World Bank. Um, it was very serendipitous that I met Graham Pyatt. I, he taught me about the SAM, started working with him. We wrote this book on planning techniques for a better future. We incorporated basic needs, poverty, into the same, uh, into the SAM uh, uh, framework. Um, I met Richard Stone at the Cambridge conference. Um, some of the people there felt this was a very transformative uh, um, meeting. Um, then I expanded the, uh, uh, the SAM to uh, Indonesia over a 10-year period. We had a team of the Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands and Cornell working with the Central Statistical Bureau uh, in Indonesia. It be became essentially institutionalized. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, um, after the uh, financial crisis, the Asian financial crisis, um, I, together with a, another student of mine, Iwan Aziz, we uh, merged the financial SAM with the real SAM and looked at the impact of the IMF recommendations at that time that had been devastating on the Indonesian economy. In one year, uh, GDP fell by 14%. And that was really based on extremely high interest rate, which starved liquidity for the whole country. So we used this CGE model to simulate uh, alternative scenarios, and we found that uh, somewhat different policies could have much uh, more uh, desirable uh, outcomes. Together with David Stifel, we built an arch-type uh, African country, uh, SAM and uh, uh, CGE. And then finally, uh, last thing I'm going to say is, uh, again, I was very happy but also humble that uh, Walter Isard, who is a father of regional science, when he was, I think, 75, came to see me and he said, you know, I'm a student of Leontief and I know all about input-output. Can you teach me the SAM? So I would spend hours with uh, uh, Walter trying to teach him the SAM. He was a very quick uh, learner. Um, he became a, uh, an advocate of the SAM, and uh, this led to uh, a, a book which now is uh, uh, perhaps the Bible in uh, uh, regional uh, science. So thank you very much for your patience and uh, indulgence into what has been a long journey, and I hope it's not over yet. Uh,